here in, in Boston, Massachusetts, I guess, the other Boston. During these eight days, nine days, between Ascension Thursday and Pentecost. And you consider those first days of that retreat that was made 2,000 years ago when St. Peter and the Apostles were together in prayer in the upper room. Now consider what is in their minds and their hearts. Consider the Holy Mother of God whom they are with. Consider the world that is out in front of them. Now when you consider that time, there are a total of 12 men in fact, 120 altogether, with those that are with them, who believe in God, who really believe in Jesus Christ. We could fit those 120 men in any one of our, in our little chapel in Kentucky. All of them could fit inside of there. And that was the entirety of the whole church of Jesus Christ. And these 120 were gathered together with the 12 apostles, and the 12 apostles were in the upper room, and they were there for nine days in a sacred retreat. We're in that time right now. Between Ascension Thursday and 9 o'clock in the morning on Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Ghost would ascend with tongues of fire. They don't know about tongues of fire. They don't know about their future. They don't know when they will see Jesus Christ again. He went up into heaven on Ascension Thursday, and all they have is the joy of the resurrection inside of their hearts, the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ somehow over death, and now he's departed from them, and they are with Mary in prayer. And they are contemplating the beauty of the life of Jesus Christ, and how wonderful were his miracles, and then they are listening to the word of our Lord that he said to them before he went up into heaven. He said, Going therefore... Teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. They have this final instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all these men, they can only fit in one, they can all fit in one small chapel. They're there with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Not only did they hear these words, but Satan also heard these words. And he knew the greatness of the God that he was fighting against. And he heard him say to these 12 men, and to, those, and to the 72 disciples, and the others that would follow them, Go and teach the gospel to every nation. Go everyone that they must believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. That they must have this true faith. And what do they do for the next nine days? They continue in prayer with the Blessed Virgin Mary. And consider that moment. At that moment, one little grenade, one attack of Roman soldiers, one strong wind, one fire, could wipe out the entirety of the Catholic Church. It was very fragile. And these men... Though they had seen the victory of the death of our Lord, Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ over death and his victory by death, they now had something in their hearts where now they were no longer afraid of death like they were before. And there they are in the upper room with the Blessed Virgin Mary, and they don't know. Our Lord said them to them, teach the gospel to every nation. Teach the gospel to every creature. Make all the dogs Catholic. Make all the animals of every type Catholic. Make all of men Catholic. Make every nation Catholic. Make the whole world Catholic. That's the only simple instruction I have for you. And now you 12 men go out and go to the earth. Go to the entirety of the earth. And now they are sitting and contemplating with the Holy Mother of God. Inside of that holy upper room. On the outside is Satan. On the outside is an entire world that is like unto the time of the flood, except there's one big difference. At the time of the flood, all of those that lived were inside of the ark, and everyone outside is going to die and must necessarily die. But now there are 12 men inside the ark, 
And they are told, go outside of this ark and bring every creature into the ark, not just two by two. Not, but you bring in every creature to the ark. You make the ark able to expand to the entirety of the earth. I want to make this boat so big that it will encompass the entire earth. You're going to be construction of boat constructors. You're going to be bridge builders, which is what the word pontifex means. You're going to be go out and build bridges. Go out and construct boats. Go out and get to the very ends of the earth and take every creature and bring him the gospel. There are nine days. What should they be considering? How can we do this? And remember a few days earlier, holy women went to the tomb. And they were wonderful women. But when they went to that tomb, on the day that Jesus Christ had wiped out all death, destroyed all of hell, they worried and they said, Who shall roll back for us the stone? Who's going to roll back the stone? Now the apostles thought it was impossible to roll back the stone. The soldiers were guarding it. And they were worried about a little rock. A rock that could easily fit inside of this room. And though it's a big stone, it's not that big. Three or four heavy men could roll, but strong men could roll it aside. It wasn't that big of a rock. And they were worried about a little rock. And they didn't know how it could be rolled back and who could roll it back. That's what they worried about only a few days ago. But now, after 40 days of Christ appearing them between the resurrection and the ascension, and God said to them on Ascension Thursday, Go and turn over a remove every mountain. St. Gregory the Wonder Worker would fulfill literally the word of God. When God said, if you, have the, if you have the faith to move mountains, it shall move. And Gregory the bishop one day visited, he visited the two farmers that were fighting, two brothers fighting each other, trying to kill each other over a farm. And one of them had, a, had a, a farm on side of the mountain, and the other one had the farm next to the sea. And so he solved the problem by moving the mountain. He said, I'll make it bigger. So he moved the entire mountain. And it is moved to this day because Gregory said, to the mountain to move, and it moved. What changed? The world was just as wicked after the resurrection as it was before. Men were just as timid before as after. But what changed? Something changed in the heart of an apostle. That's what happened. Something changed in the heart of 12 men. And what do we say about these 12 men? They are the pillars and the ground of our church. They hold up all of us. Something happened to their hearts during those 40 days. These men that were afraid of their own shadow, these men that would lock themselves up in the upper room, these men who were afraid of death, who didn't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead when they were told clearly that he was, something happened to their hearts. And now they're told, go out and convert the whole world. Where does the conversion of the world begin? It begins in the heart of the priest. This is where it begins. God made the world in such a way that we need each other. We are social creatures. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, He who hears you, hears me. He said it to twelve weak, weak men. And he said it to fishermen. And he said, he who despises you, despises me. And he said, you go out to the ends of the earth. I want you to be the carriers of my gospel. And one who was born out of due time was not there with those twelve. And what did he say to him? This is the vessel of election. And I must, you must go, Ananias, and go to Saul of Tarsus, and you must cure his blindness, because he is a vessel of election. He is a holy vessel. What does that vessel carry inside of himself? He carries Jesus Christ. He carries God. He carries heaven. God made the world that it would be able to be converted by what happens in the heart of a priest. That's how he made things. Peter was terrible for the world. When he cursed and he swore that he did not know the man, 
He didn't believe that he was God anymore. And he was more afraid of his own health being lost than of being associated, being associated with our Lord Jesus Christ. And he called him only a man. And what happened on the day that he said, I do not know the man? The man died. And all of his sheep fled him. Not just Peter. It was a terrible day for the world because Simon Peter said, I do not know the man. And he cursed and he swore. And he found some other way to be comfortable than the way of being with Jesus Christ. But he did one wise thing that night on Good Friday. When he looked at Jesus Christ, and he saw that he had failed him, he went out and he wept bitterly. And all the ugliness and all the evil that came from the wicked choice of Peter went away. Because it was two priests that brought about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Had these two priests not failed, Jesus Christ would not have died. And this was the high priest of the Old Testament, Caiaphas, who was a true representative of God. He turned against God. He used his power to bring about crucifixion. The heart of Caiaphas turned ugly, and the whole world had to pay. And then Peter turned into a coward, and the whole world had to pay. And hence Jesus Christ would say, before these nine days, only 15 days after the resurrection, he would say, Simon, son of John, you're just a man. But I've got one question for you that matters to the whole world. It matters to everyone. Lovest thou me? Do you love me? Because if you don't, it's a terrible thing for the whole world. And if you do, the whole world shall be blessed. Simon, son of John, do thou love me? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. Then my lambs can be fed. And if he does not love, the lambs cannot be fed. It's very important what happens in the heart of a priest. Is extremely important. And what is needed right now is the conversion of the priest. During these nine days, these priests, these same men that were cowards, these same men that cursed and swore, these same men that fought amongst each other, who shall be the first and the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, these same men persevered in prayer with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Nine days she formed their hearts. Nine days they were with her. And then, at the end of that time, at nine o'clock in the morning, the Holy Ghost came down. Now consider the other side. And that is the side of hell. In the side of hell, there is great fear and trepidation. There is great terror. Because Satan has conquered everyone. He saw Adam, the priest, Adam the king, Adam filled with perfection, and he defeated Adam quickly. He saw Eve, the most beautiful of all ladies, and he defeated her quickly. But now there's a new Adam, and the new Adam defeated Satan. There's a new Eve, and the new Eve defeated Satan, and there are new children of God. The children of Adam are born with original sin. But what are the children of God? This line of promise, that is the line of promise of the New Testament, it is the line of the bishop putting his hands upon the head and making a young man a priest. And then later on making him bishop. And then making more priests and making more bishops until the ending of the world. And so many will be Judases. And so many will be hirelings. And so many will fall into hell, so much so that St. John Chrysostom says that the majority of priests do go to hell and that the road to hell is paved by the skulls of the bishops. And yet, even with all this tragedy, not all bishops go to hell. Not all priests go to hell. And the priest that has Christ in his heart 
and the priest that carries the Blessed Virgin Mary in his heart. When all of hell fights against the priest, hell fails. It matters what happens in the heart of the priest. It matters very much. And hence, we listen carefully when the Lord Jesus Christ says to Simon, Son of John, lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? The three most important questions that God ever asks to a man. Dost thou love me? And the answer uh, depends on the answer depends the salvation of the world. And hence it makes the most perfect sense that as we get towards the end of the world, the Holy Mother, God himself, asks the same question of Simon, the son of John, who is the high priest in Rome. Lovest thou me? Right now the answer is no. Therefore, the world is in a most tragic state. But one day, Simon, son of John, the descendant and successor of St. Peter, shall respond finally with the, with the, with the heart of St. Peter, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Then feed my lambs, obey my command of heaven. And when the heart of the Holy Father finally becomes holy, when the heart of the Holy Father finally changes, and when the heart of the Holy Father finally obeys heaven, it's going to change the entire world. We say that the faith is the most important thing, and yes it is. The faith is always true. Every damned soul in hell believes the truths of faith. Every soul in heaven believes the truth of faith. But the faith of the greatest saints in heaven does not benefit the earth. And the faith of the, of the most wicked souls in hell does not benefit the earth. But the faith of a living man, the faith of someone breathing, as we say in Latin, in statu vie, in the state of the wayfarer, that heart is the one that shall be necessary to transfer Faith from generation to generation to defeat Satan. And hence it is a most important battle that happens inside the heart of the priest. Hence the wisdom of the church. A young man gets ordained a subdeacon. He gets ordained a deacon. He gets ordained a priest. What is your most important duty? Every day you will pick up that holy book called the breviary. It contains the sacred scripture and it has in it the heart of David. And you shall read these words every day until you die. And one of the wise, wise moves of Satan in the last 50 years was to remove the holy bravery from the hands of the priest. And no longer reads the word of God. They don't no even call it the bravery. They don't no even call it the work of God. They call it the liturgy of the hours. And they don't, have, they don't ever see it as the true opus dei, the true work of God, which St. Benedict called it, and he built Christendom on that work. Any man can say the bravery, but God has designated that it is the priest of God who must pick up that book, the priest of God who must read it, the priest of God who must let it somehow enter his heart. And then it will be possible for his heart to be a priestly heart. And then that heart defeats Satan. That heart carries us from generation to generation. In these nine days, before the Holy Ghost comes, the Blessed Virgin Mary is preparing the heart of the priest. There are so many people that they are all important and loved by God. But he devoted three and a half years to the heart of his priests. And when Saul of Tarsus became St. Paul, he also made him spend three years also. He could not go immediately to preach the word of God. He had to spend three years in the Felix Arabia, near Bombay, India. There he spent three years. And three years he was there speaking to God. He was with Jesus Christ in the flesh, not just the divinity, but in the flesh. Hence, the priest must have a physical connection to God. 
He has the priesthood that was given to him by being ordained. But he must also have the blessed sacrament always near him. Somehow he must be in the presence of the master. Sometimes he's good. Sometimes he's bad. Sometimes he is indifferent and doesn't care. But all the time, he must be with him. And somehow then, our Lord Jesus Christ slowly forms the heart. Because what is going to defeat Satan? It is the priesthood. God is God. But how did he save the world? He united his divinity in a hypostatic union to a humanity so that that humanity was chrismated. We call him Christ. What does Christ mean? The anointed one of God. Christ refers to his humanity that is so anointed that every part of the body of Jesus Christ drips through the oil of the holy oil of divine priesthood. Every part of his body is soaked with oil. When Moses made Aaron a priest, he soaked his head in its beard. But when the new priest is made, every atom and molecule is soaked with the holy oil. This oil is terrorized, terrorizes hell. And Satan is terrified of the priest. He is not only terrified of the holy priest, he is terrified also of the unholy priest who lives in sin. He's terrified of the priest who has even turned over to his kingdom and become a Satanist. He's petrified of the priest because as long as he's in this world in his priesthood, he can turn. As long as he's in this world the priesthood, he has a power given only to the living priest. For a living priest is able to raise his hands and say, Ego te absolvo apocatis tuis. And holiness comes forth from his hands even if he himself is not holy. Holiness is there. Now, what happens when this holiness unites to the heart? It is the will of God that the priest become a saint. But priests are terrified of becoming saints. They are not, are not desirous of becoming saints because we're afraid of the cross that sanctity leads us to. During these nine days, the holy apostles are with Mary and they are rejoicing that Jesus Christ has conquered death. They are rejoicing that he is with them. Though they can no longer see his eye, with their eyes his body. He's gone into heaven and they can't, they can't see his body anymore. But they will carry that body to the ends of the earth. And now 2,000 years later, the body of Jesus Christ still anoints. It's still holy. It still makes alter Christus, another Christ. And the priesthood is still the answer to the troubles in the world today. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ said, The harvest indeed is great, but pray to the Lord of the harvest that he send laborers into the harvest. And these laborers must spend time with Mary. These laborers must touch the blessed sacrament. These laborers must hold the holy breviary in their hands. These laborers must somehow let that word of David that is found in the bravery and the heart of David. They must all let the hand of the Holy Mother and somehow let the body of our Lord Jesus Christ inundate their being so that they might carry the Blessed Virgin, carry the warlike and great heart of David, and carry the Savior of the world with them wherever they go. No one can conquer him, and hence they will sing of the New Testament priest. As they sing about David... Saul killed his thousands, and he was a great warrior, but David tens of thousands. And so it is, the great prophets of the Old Testament save thousands, but the prophets of the New Testament shall save tens of thousands. And there shall be a greater vanquishing of Satan by the prophets of the New Testament than there was by the prophets of the Old. And this, there must be a carrying of Jesus Christ. But where is he carried most, first and foremost? He is carried in the heart. He's carried inside of our being. He comes out through our passions. He is in every part of our bodies. And this is the answer to the wickedness of Satan. Even today, when the church has collapsed, and the majority of priests do not know God, 
They do not love him and they do not serve him. In fact, they know love and serve themselves and the devil. But because they have the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God can touch them in statu vie, in this life. And there can be a conversion of the heart. We pray for that conversion to happen to Pope Francis. It doesn't matter how wicked he is. He is priest of God and he is high priest. And one day, the grace of God can touch him. And if he stands up, Satan shall cower in terror and fear. Satan has no trouble being defeated by God. He has two problems. He cannot stand being defeated by a woman. And she shall defeat him and shall crush his head. And he cannot stand being defeated by a man, a lowly human man. But the priest of God defeats Satan. Be gone, Satan, the priest of God may say. And so he does say. He kicks Satan out every time he absolves in confession. He drives Satan out every time he baptizes. He drives Satan out every time he preaches the word of God. And Satan is driven out. The devil is terrified of priests. And wisely he's terrified of priests. And though it's true what St. John Chrysostom says, so many priests are in hell. It is also true that no one is in heaven without the priest. There are two sides of that story. And heaven is greater than hell and shall always be. And one soul in heaven is worth a billion souls in hell. And so every victory of a priest is so much greater than any defeat. So let's pray for the priests that their hearts be transformed. During these nine days, God decided that his holy mother would devote herself only to priests. And the Holy Ghost would come and descend upon only priests and the Blessed Virgin Mary to show that she is truly the mother of God and the mother of the priests. And then... St. Peter, the same one that said 53 days before, I do not know the man. That same Peter will stand up and say, everyone come into the religion of Jesus Christ whom you crucified. He's speaking to all the Jews in front of him. You crucified him. We are witnesses of that crucifixion. And he has defeated death. And you must enter into his religion. And imagine the power with which that fisherman preached his first sermon on Pentecost Sunday. 3,000 were baptized and became saints that day. The next day, 2,000 will be baptized. And then that church would spread to the ends of the earth, and it cannot, will not be stopped so long as there is priest. And God has made sure that there shall always be priests. Every generation must have priests. We must make priests continue to the next generation. It is a most important and the most important work to form the heart of a priest. Because from this heart, all hearts are formed. And from this body, all bodies are saved. And from these passions, all passions are turned only to God. The hypostatic union is the only union that brings about peace and drags us into the kingdom of heaven. And our Lord Jesus Christ, Quaramoto, in a certain way, truly passed on this union to his holy priests. When he said, he who hears you, hears me. As the Father had sent me, I also send you. You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. I no longer call you slaves, but friends. Jesus Christ calling a man friend. Only equals can be friends, says St. Augustine. How can we be called friend? We cannot be friend of God because he is too high. Therefore, God lowered himself to the level of a man and made himself a true man. And then he picked up man to be the level of him and called him friend. And this man is called priest, who has neither beginning of days nor end of life. He's not the priest of Aaron. He's not the priest of the Old Testament. He is the priest of the New Testament. Let us carry these priests through our present generation all the way until the ending of time. It doesn't take very many 
priests to defeat Satan. It was one sacred heart that defeated hell. God does not need to use many human hearts, but he has chosen to use human hearts and let our hearts be united to him and pray everyone for the priest, and especially the high priest, Pope Francis, who truly is the high priest, despite all the arguments and all the disputes, he is the high priest. And his priesthood must be, he must repent and follow his priesthood. And there must be a repentance and touching of the heart. And when he obeys heaven, by the grace of God, Satan shall be defeated by the consecration of Russia. And why is it that God said, anyone, everybody consecrate Russia? He didn't say that. He said, I want the Holy Father. I want the priest to consecrate Russia. Many people say, I do not know the man. And it's tragic for them. But when the priest says, I don't know the man, it is tragic for all. And so likewise, many men say, I do know the man. I do love him. He is God. And it's beneficial to some. But when the priest says, I know the man, and I am his representative and his captain, and I carry his kingdom inside of me, and when I walk into this house, I say to you what God told me to say, the kingdom of heaven has arrived. This is what we carry. There is nothing else that the world needs than the heart of the priest. So hard to form that heart. It took Jesus Christ shedding every drop of his blood. It took David writing all 150 of his psalms. It took the journey of his whole life. It took, it took the, the Blessed Virgin Mary to be the mother of sorrows. It took Joseph to be the protector. It took so many things to form the heart of priests. Let there be vessels of election in our time to carry on St. Peter to carry on the other 11 apostles, to carry on St. Paul, to carry on the holy priests from this generation as we carry it in the last until the next, until the end of time, and Satan shall be defeated. As Jesus Christ, the priest, said wisely to his fellow priests, and the day he ordained them, confidite, have confidence, because I have already conquered the world. Satan is already defeated. And hence, during these nine days, when the apostles were there in that upper room with the Holy Mother, and the whole world hated them, and the whole world was against them, they had no fear, they had no worry, they had only joy, and they carried that joy all the way until the ends of the earth. These 12 men, including the St. Matthias, they are the great pillars of our church and let us stand upon the pillars of their hearts and carry their hearts to the ending of time. That's what we must do. But in any case, it's a sacred time these days between Ascension Thursday and Pentecost Sunday. It's a time of the prayer of the priest and the whole world depends upon the prayer of the priest. Let us pray for the priests that the priests may learn how to pray. And when we consecrate a church, the choir sings, Locus iste sanctus es. This is a holy place. And why is it a holy place? It is the place in which the priest prays. We don't say it's a holy place because of the Blessed Sacrament, because of the crucifixion. It is a holy place because that's where the priest prays. It must be important for the priest to pray, for the Holy Ghost to say that. Holy places depend upon the place of prayer. Christ said his most sacred prayer on the cross when he sang the Psalm 21. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me upon the holy cross? And it's a holy place because that's where Christ prayed in his agony, in his greatest agony. The Garden of Gethsemane is a holy place because that's where Christ prayed. Israel is a holy place because that's where Christ prayed. And the church is holy because this is where Christ prays. It's very important what happens in the heart of the priest. And let the priest learn how to pray. Let prayer enter into their hearts. And then from this prayer shall come the defeating of Satan and the victory of heaven. And Satan is wisely afraid of even the wicked priest because the power of prayer is in him. 
He just has to grab onto it. He just has to lay hold of it. And when he does, Satan is completely defeated. And we follow the great victory and remember the great victory of the martyrs over the devil. I'm closing up to you all, ending with the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost.